experiencing. Today we're going to look at the love of God, the first of the one another passages. Now I'll reveal how old I am now. Um, uh, how many of you know the, the song by the Beatles, Imagine? Imagine all the people, yeah. And the one refrain always was, it was interesting because I, I yearn for it as well. You may say that I'm a dreamer, but I'm not the only one. I hope someday you'll join us and the world will be as one. And that was always, you know, that's, yeah, they got it right. That's, I think everyone's yearning, especially in this age of polarization. We, we yearn for all of us finally coming together. Um, interesting, that's God's vision as well. We looked at that uh, last week. After this, I looked, and there was before me a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, and people, and language, and they were all worshiping God. That's, just, that's the trajectory of the church. And I think the Beatles actually had the path right as well, in that they said, they wrote a song called, All You Need Is Love. Uh, and God agrees. You know, love is the key. I and them, you and me, so that they may be brought to complete unity, then the world will know that you sent me, and have loved them as you have loved me. In fact, love is the first fruit of the Spirit. In fact, some people say it's the only fruit of the Spirit, and all the other um, uh, fruit are expressions of love. Uh, the Apostle Paul said there's faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of these is yeah, love. Um, it was love that brought God down to earth, for God so loved uh, the world. I think the weakness of the Beatles' vision, they had the vision right, the path right, but they rejected the very thing with, that would actually get us there, and that is God. Uh, we need the power, of, it lacked the power to change a person. We need the power of God to come into our lives and give us a new self. We looked at that during Ash Wednesday. The key to real change is first we must change. We need a new self, uh, a new heart. And also kind of the weakness of the Beatles' vision or, or the, was the lack of definition of love. Uh, they just didn't define it. And, it, and over time, it just kind of devolved into this kind of self-love, a selfish love. So we're going to look at what real love is uh, biblically. Now, it is of great interest to our culture, isn't it, this issue of love? Think of how many songs have been written on love. Think of how many films, uh, how many movies. Uh, there are entire channels committed uh, to love. Hallmark Channel, LMN, you, you name it. How many romance novels have there been, romance series? Uh, we even have a day set aside for love. It was called, we just went past it too, Valentine's Day. Yeah, so it's of great interest to us. Um, there are over 100 definitions, they say, of the word love. And, and those definitions vary greatly, right? You could say, I love my dog. You could also say, I love my spouse. And I hope there's a varying difference between those two. I hope there's a vast difference in your life. Now, I was actually looking at a friend's Facebook, uh, Facebook um, profile. There's, they haven't sent me a link to their Facebook. And I noticed on the left-hand side, it says, who is your greatest love? And usually, most spouses put each other. She put her dog. And she was married. <laughs> so and we kind of scratched our head, oh, what's going on in that relationship? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I find it interesting that God defines love and he uses very picturesque words. It's actually two similes. They are very picturesque, very clear as to what love looks like. And it's in these two passages, and I'll read those. A new command I give you, love one another, and here's the first simile, as I have loved you. So you must love one, an one another. By this everyone know that you are my disciples if you love one another. And the second simile is this one. It's in Matthew. Love your neighbor as yourself. So we're going to take those two passages and unpack them. Heavenly Father, we come before you and we ask now to open our hearts and minds. Help us to get deep into what real love is. And then help us to transform our love into the type of love that you have, that you desire for us to share as well. So that our horizontal love matches the vertical love we experience it we pray in jesus name and all god's people prayed all right so what is love as i have loved you uh, love is not an abstract concept in the bible it's a concrete event 
It's not a feeling. It's a concrete event. It's the cross of Jesus. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. The word atoning sacrifice uh, is an interesting expression. Um, how many of you have seen wife swap? Where they exchange wives, it's not sexual at all. It's just doing chores and stuff and learning different relationships. So they, so they swap each other. How many of you ever traded or bartered? When I was a kid, I, for Christmas I got this... Um, this thing that made insects out of rubber. You know, you get one of those machines, they were fun. And so I'd make hundreds of them, and I'd put them in baggies. I was an entrepreneur as a young kid. And I'd go sell them to my friends at school or trade them for things in their lunches that I really liked, like ho-hos and stuff like that. So it's a good thing. And so that's kind of what happened on the cross. There was an exchange, a swap that went on. And that is God took the righteousness of Jesus and gave it to us and took our sins upon himself. So there was a swap that happened. That's what atoning sacrifice means. It cost the life of God, though, however. Now, I don't know why it did. I don't know why God had to come to earth, put on human flesh, and die a terrible death. C.S. Lewis, Lewis refers to it as the deep magic, some spiritual reality we're not unaware of, we can't figure out. But the interesting thing is, if, since that's what it took, God still did it out of love for us. That is amazing to me. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. And as a culture, we agree with that statement in that every time you hear a story where someone gave their life for another person, or you see a movie where the heroine gives their life for another out of love, it moves us. I'm always moved by the, the final scene in Saving Private Ryan, it's a great story. I can't watch the beginning of it, you know. The horrors of war, I just cannot watch it. But the story is all about a mom who lost three sons, and the general of the entire army said, we, have, we can't allow her to experience any more suffering. So he sends a, a group of men to go out in, in search of Private Ryan, and they do an all-out search at incredible personal cost to rescue this man and bring him home. And in the final scene, the Captain Ryan, who led the expedition, actually had to lay down his life in order to save Private Ryan so he could go home. And that's the story of the cross. That's the story of God coming down. He made out an all-out search for us until he found us and he rescued us, but it cost him his life. But he did it because he loved us. And if you get that love inside you, it will transform you. It will change you. It will touch you in amazing ways. So what is love as defined by the cross? It is this. Sacrificial service for the good of others at personal cost. Sacrificial service for the good of others at personal cost. Because sacrificial service, it's not a feeling. Love is not a feeling in Scripture. It is something you do. It's something you show. It may begin with ardent affection, but it's not necessary. You can love someone in spite of how you feel about them. Uh, there's an interesting poem by Oscar Hammerstein. Uh, he says, a smile is not a smile until it wrinkles your face. Bell is not a bell without ringing. A home's not a home when there's nobody there. A song's not a song without singing. Love isn't love till it's free. The love in your heart wasn't put there to stay. Oh, love isn't love till it's given away. It's something we do uh, for others. Uh, in the love chapter, we read this actually yesterday's memorial service, 1 Corinthians 13. Love is described this way. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is, does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no records of wrong. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices in the truth. Now, let's take one of those. Love is patient. How do you feel when you're trying to be patient? <laughs> There's all kinds of emotions, right? But you choose to be patient. How about not easily angered? When you're trying to hold your temper, when you're trying not to be irritated, how do you feel? <laughs> yeah, but love is choosing to go beyond your feelings, choosing to love anyway. 
So sacrificial service. Now, for the good of others, what does that mean? It's a selfless love. It's not for our good. It's for the benefit of others. Christ didn't die on the cross for his own benefit. He didn't get a bump in pay. Uh, he didn't get an elevated status. He did what was in our best interest. And that was, that's sacrificial service for the good of others. It's having their bit best interest in mind and not our own best interest. It's not in order, we don't do good to others in order to feel good about ourselves, though you may. Uh, it's not to validate or earn our salvation because our salvation is by grace. It's not something we can do. It's something that has been done for us. We do good for others not because it makes all, us look better, like United Way. I don't know in, the, in this area, but where we live, uh, United Way you know, companies put a lot of pressure on people to give to United Way because it made the boss look good or made the company look good. But that's not Christian love. You don't do it so it makes you look good. It's, it's simply because it's the right thing to do. It's the loving thing to do. I'm a little bothered that in, in schools, at least the schools where we came from, um, I, I mean, they're trying to teach our kids uh, how to serve. I think that's really important value. But a lot of our kids, in fact, most of our kids did it because it looked good on their resume. It would, it would mean they would be able to go to the college of their choice. So they wasn't really serving because it was the loving thing to do or the right thing to do. It's because it made them look better. And I had parents tell me they were worried about their kids. So at age four, they were already building their kids' resumes and getting them involved in all kinds of things. Uh, biblical love is giving without benefit to self. I notice a lot of charities are moving to the model of Having a big banquet dinner, uh, usually pretty expensive, and, uh, and then having auctions and raffles. And, I'm, and they do a lot of good things, but is that real love? It's not really biblical love because in those charities, I, I give $2,000, that's good, but I get a week in Tahoe in exchange. <laughs> that's not biblical love nor biblical giving. It's giving because it's the right thing to do without any personal benefit. Uh, it's not in order to get better karma. I find it's interesting. We live in a culture. This is the new thing now. The reason why you avoid bad things, doing bad things to others, so you don't get bad karma. And the only reason you do good for others, so you can get good karma. So the only reason I do good is because I want good things to happen to me. That's personal benefit. That's not biblical love, however. Um, biblical, biblical love is doing good for others without any benefit to ourselves. At and this is the last one, personal cost. Uh, David, w God told David to build an altar and sacrifice to him. Uh, David went to this guy's uh, threshing floor and he asked to buy. And the guy said, no, you're the king. This is a righteous thing. I want to give it to you. But David said, said an interesting thing. But the king replied, no, I insist on paying for it. I will not sacrifice to the Lord my God burnt offerings that cost me nothing. And that's, that's love. It's sacrificial service for the good of others at personal cost. It should cost us something. It costs Jesus a lot. Who being the very nature of God did not, did not consider equality with God something to be used for his own advantage. Wasn't that interesting? Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Sacrificial service at personal cost. We focus on the cost of his life, but he paid a, a, a much higher price, I think. Uh, he not only gave his life, he, it cost him, it cut into his lifestyle. Um, he left heaven, he came to earth. He left a seven-star resort and lived a uh, Motel 6 existence. Um, he was spirit, and he became flesh. A spirit feels no pain. God never felt pain, because he's a spirit. Now he's flesh, now he experiences pain and suffering and loss. He was a king, now he's a servant. He was God, now he's a man. He was important, now he's unknown. He's a nobody. I imagine the part, for me, that would, the part, hardest part to, uh, for me would have been, imagine God having written scripture, come down and preaches it, and people say, you don't know what you're talking about. You're twisting it. You got it all wrong. What are you talking about? I wrote the book. All right? That would be so frustrating. 
He, uh, he saved others. I'd have pulled myself off the cross on this one. He saved, you, you're lucky I'm not Jesus. You know, he, he saved others himself. He could not say, I can show you I can save myself. But he refused to save himself because the, it was the only way he could save us. So it was the greatest demonstration of power to avoid coming off the cross, though he could. He did it because it was the only way he could save us, which is kind of ironic, isn't it? Imagine the humiliation. And that's what love is. It's, it not only cuts into your life, he, he bled, it cuts into your lifestyle as well. It's, it's, it's hurts. It's painful. What does it look like in real life? Uh, imagine you just climbed into bed and you're exhausted. It was a long week. And uh, you hear a rap on the door, and it's a friend. And they're in need, but you're tired. But you get up anyway. And maybe they need some financial resources. That's going to make things really tight, but you do it anyway. Because you're the friend. Uh, you're at work. A coworker is swamped. You give aid to the person. The project turns out extremely well. You don't say anything. They take credit for it. Uh, you're married. The baby cries. You know what you do. You both pretend you're sleeping, don't you? <laughs> you wave each other out. Who's going to break? Sacrificial service, you break. You know, give your spouse the sleep. You do it. You get up. You change the baby. You rock whatever they need done. Uh, you're aware and you help your spouse fulfill their dreams, their goals, not just your own. From parenting, it's instead of having a vision. For, you, I think it's important to have a vision for our kids. But not just because we impose it upon their lives and we force them to, to kind of fulfill our vision rather than God's vision for their life. Do we, do we actually plea them to explore how God designed them and God's calling on their life? Um, I get all kinds of different reactions. I, uh, because I grew up in a poor family and I wanted to put myself through college, I made it a commitment to myself and to my kids that I would put them through college and pay for it. I'd pay the tuition. Now, I'll tell that story to people, and people think I'm just crazy. <laughs> right? what would, why would you do such a thing? And I think of that Beatles song, people say that I'm crazy, but I'm not the only one. Anyway, I do it because I serve a God who loved me the same way he loves sacrificially. Now, I tell you, every month it hurts, because every month it's tight. But it, it, it's because of the type of God that I have. It cuts when you love this way, it cuts into your life and your lifestyle. So, when you do things, ask three questions. Or if you want to discover, am I doing the loving thing? Ask yourself three things. First, what am I doing in response to the situation? Love is something you do. Secondly, are my motives pure? Is it for my benefit or is it for their benefit? And what is it costing me? It should cost me something. Uh, John says, this is how we know what love is. Now notice the progression. Jesus laid down his life for us. So that's the model. As, he, as he, uh, he has loved us. As a result, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. Application. And then he gives a concrete example. This is where it cuts into your lifestyle. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother and sister in need, but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? So the love that we experience vertically is the same love we are to express horizontally to other. And does your vertical experience of God's love match your horizontal love for others? That's the challenge. One little quick note on um, the phrase new command. What can, we should talk about it because Jesus quotes Leviticus 19.18, so it's not a new command. What, what, he, what he's referring to is Two things. It's new in two ways, though. There's a new example. Before in the Old Testament, it was the land that laid down his life. In the New Testament, it was God who lays down his life for us. Uh, and the, uh, there's a second way it's new. It's, it's a new experience. It's a, the word new also means fresh. Like, the, for instance, the sunrise. Every morning the sun rises, and it's a new morning. It's a fresh experience of morning. Now, it's the same old sun. But when it rises, it's a fresh experience of a new morning. And the same thing is true as he's loved us. Every time we experience love, sacrificial love, biblical love, it moves us. We re-experience the same love God showed us on the cross. It's the same old cross. But every time we experience the cross, it's like a fresh new experience as well. Now, as, uh, as yourself, what does that phrase mean? 
I'm going to go a little tiny long today, but this is worth it, I think. I think you will enjoy it, I think. All right. As I, as yourself, loving people as yourself, it does not mean, I thought it was, okay, I love my, I love, here's how I experience love. I like uh, lots of touch. So I'm going to, so if that's how I experience love, then I'm going to touch everybody. Now, is that loving if you have been experienced uh, a sex crime? If you're a victim of a sex crime, is that loving? You, you don't want anyone to touch you. What if you're a burn victim? All right, what if you just got a bad sunburn? All right. Um, is that is that loving? Is that what it means? Uh, no, it's it's more selfless than that. It's not loving in the way that's convenient for me. I want people to love me in a way that I can experience love. So as a result, I want to love others in a way that they experience love, which means I need to understand how they experience love before I can love them. Uh, this is important because I was dumb. I was really hurt um, when my daughter told my my kids, and then me later, that she never thought I loved her. And I thought, what is she talking about? I was at every game, every play, every, I never, I scheduled it in, I never missed an event. I was involved, I was an active father, I provided well for them. I got them a lot of great gifts at Christmas time, tremendous traditions, you know, family traditions, many memories. I wasn't like my father, I told them I loved them, I told them I was pr proud of them. What, and I did a lot of great things for them. What is she talking about? But her love language was at words of affirmation. And I admit, I tended to love more in doing things for my kids, like putting them through college. That should be enough, you know? But her love language was words of affirmation. And I'll admit, I was a little, um, I wasn't as verbal. Men tend to be as verbal. But I was not as verbal probably as I should have. As a result, she never thought I loved her. And I did. This is why it's so important for us to love as ourselves, meaning loving it in a way that others can experience love the way they experience love. Now, every church has always told me, and you guys told me the same thing, so I'm going to take you at your word. You want to reach young people, right? If you, want, you agree, you guys want to reach young people, bring a bunch of them in here. All right. Here's, it's what it takes. If you're going to love your, others as yourself, it takes time, it takes conversation. It takes understanding, which means you have to learn something, and it takes action. You have to act on it. No. So how do we love generationally? Well, first, you've got to understand them. So let's, I'm going to help you understand the different generations. I'm going to start with the boomers. We're not that young. I'm not, I'm not a boomer. I'm younger than that. Uh, you are a boomer if you were born in 1943 to 1960. How many boomers are out there? Yell. Yeah. All right. You lived in a day there was such a thing as objective truth. People believed in it. Uh, it was an optimistic era. Truth was discovered through science and, and, and psychology and reasoning. We really believed that if we just put our minds to it, we could solve any problem. As a result, they oriented their lives around truth. The spiritual question of the gen this generation was, was it true? As a result, lots of writers set out um, proof texts or arguments. Uh, apologetics were big trying to prove the validity of Jesus, the reality of God's claims. There's the books of C.S. Lewis and Josh McDowell, Evidence That Demands a, a Verdict. Uh, Lee Strobel, The Case for Christ. Uh, this was the era of the creation versus evolution debates. Uh, evolution was the challenge. They tried to prove that, no, just look at the design arguments, look at the probability, look at, look at all this information in order to kind of prove, lean towards the reality of God. Um, the believe in the highest for the gospel is by getting the information out there. And if you get that out there and you win the argument, you win people. And they did it in efficient ways. They discovered efficient ways of getting the message out. This is where stadium events emerged. You got Billy Graham. You got Promise Keepers. You got college forums. Now we use DVDs. We bring that information into every home. All the greatest speakers in the whole world brought right into your living room. The cultural challenges... Uh, that they face what were these. One is the claim that Christianity is just a myth. Uh, Jesus never really lived. He wasn't a historic figure. It was the quest for the historic Jesus. And then when they discovered, yeah, actually there are texts, historic texts that prove that Jesus was really lived here. Then there was the, this, the Jesus of faith versus the Jesus of life. Uh, the Jesus of faith was a creation of the church over time. There, there's the Jesus of life, the real man, the historic person, just an inspiring figure. Uh, there was a challenge of, as to what was real. 
What was real was what you could taste, touch, and see. This, if he couldn't prove it by a scientific method, it wasn't real. So God wasn't real, and God wasn't necessary anyway, because if he could, tr- if he could prove a natural path of creation, if he could actually map that path, not only could it have happened, but if I could find a path, it actually happened that way. Not that if you can find a way, does it mean it, ha- it had to happen that way? No. So that's the boomers. Now, I'm giving a lot of general things, not a comprehensive picture, but enough so you can understand these generations. How about Gen Xers? Okay, if you were born between 1961 and 1981, you were a Gen X. How many Gen Xers are out there? That's me too. Woo! I'm, I'm first year Gen X, all right? I led the way, man, so don't talk to me about this. <laughs> no. um, for Gen Xers, arguments, proofs, large group events do not work for us, all right? Uh, what is true does not resonate. Uh, the objective truth your parents saw, you don't see. You're the first postmodern generation. Uh, there's no such thing as objective truth. Uh, what is true is it's, it's, it's personal. Truth is personal. It, what's true for me is true for me. And you have your truth, I have my truth. Uh, there's... Uh, the problem with truth is all truth begins with personal bias, personal prejudice. As wrote, there's no real true news. It's usually spin. It's slant. History is hard to, to interpret because everyone, it's your interpretation. You choose what material you include or not include and what weight you give to it. Uh, ex, ex, <laughs> pardon the expression. This is the best way I can think of, of, of saying it. They're the best BS detectors on the planet. <laughs> They know propaganda. They know hype. They know if you're trying to sell them. Uh, there's a lot of mistrust in this generation. The majority of them grew up latchkey. They let themselves in. The parents weren't around. They did not grow up in a multi-generational family. Boomers grew up on TV like Leave it to Beaver and Andy Griffith. Uh, exes grew up on Cheers and Friends. The important thing was to be part of a tribe. The family was the new family of like-minded people. They do not trust big institutions. They don't trust family, corporations, work, or the institutional church because these institutions failed many of them. Uh, They don't live to work like boomers do. They work to live, meaning they're willing to uh, take a lower-paying job being in a a less fast-paced profession living in a less fast-paced area, even though it means they won't make as much if they can actually have a better quality of life. They're willing to make that sacrifice. Um, they value authenticity and honesty. Uh, you cannot just rush in to share your faith with them. They want to know if you're a real human being. First, share me your mess before you share me your Savior. The spiritual question they have is, what is real? And the way to reach this generation just, is to share your personal story. Because you can challenge all kinds of other truths, but what is true for you is true for you. Uh, it's hard to uh, argue with a person's personal experience. So share your faith with them because truth is personal. Tell evangelists, turn them off. Because they failed morally over and over again. They let us down. Uh, the cr- cultural critique is over the issue of truth. Is there objective truth? Isn't it uh, arrogant and intolerant for someone to say, I am the way, the truth, and the life? They see Christians as hypocrites. They don't talk the walk. They don't walk the talk. They talk the way. Yeah. Uh, it's, I find it interesting, too, when I see Xers trying to convert, the boomers trying to convert Xers, because boomers lay out all these proofs and arguments, and it just doesn't work on them. They want to hear your story, but they want to hear first your personal struggles first. Know you're a real human being. Millennials, okay, millennials, 1982. How am I doing? Oh, ooh. To 2002, I'm almost done. How many of you are out there? Millennials. Oh, man, we got work to do. <laughs> uh, they look at Xers and they think they're a bunch of nasal gazers. They're so in tune with themselves. They're the second post-modern generation. There are between 80 to 100 million of them. There are, in, in contrast, there are only 60 to 80 million boomers, only 40 to 60 million Xers, 80 to 100 million. That's why the markets are driven by them, because they have a, they, they are a great market. They're a huge market. They grew up now, they, the, the pendulum swung in the family. The others were latchkey. These grew up 
maybe in overly involved parents. And they grew up in child-centered homes, helicopter moms, soccer moms, tiger moms. And it was all about productivity and lots of extracurricular activities. Unlike the extras who like to just hang out, they need to hang out for a purpose. There has to be a reason, something you produce, something you achieve. There has to be a goal. They're a very optimistic generation, but they're also very pragmatic. They want to make a difference in the world, and making a difference is, is in a tangible, hands-on type of way. Um, I'm blessed by the fact that they, they're very civic-minded. They tie spending to a mission, like Thomas McCann. I, 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 my daughter just drives me crazy in this area. I don't know why. She would rather spend like $80 on a Tom McCann shoe because half of that proceeds buys a shoe for a kid in a third world or a poor area of the city versus you can get that same, same shoe for 20 bucks on Amazon. That's what I would do. Now, it kind of puts me to shame to think that I am so selfish that I want to keep all the money for myself. So I'm un unwilling to spend a little 20 or $40 more so someone else can help a shoe. I love this generation because they are so giving, even at personal sacrifice. But they're a little narcissistic in, in that they're the generation of the selfie, the selfie stick, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. Uh, their spiritual question is, what is good? They grew up in an era of conflict and hostility and polarization and global warming and pandemics and crisis. They want to know what difference does faith make in the real world. If it doesn't make any real difference in the real world, just get out of the way. Uh, they have big dreams, but they tend to lack the ability to, to the know how to get there. Someone will hit 25 and they wonder, why am I not the CEO of the company? Why, aren't the, why am I not the senior pastor already? <laughs> they want answers to life's problems, but they tend to lack the survival skills. That's why YouTube videos are really important. Uh, my my son-in-law is this. Um, my son-in-law um, got married and didn't own a single tool. So two Christmas ago, I bought him all the fundamental tools you'll need for any home repair. And I went and visited him, and his faucet was leaking. And I said, why don't you fix the leak? I don't know how. It, but you just take this wrench, and you go... <laughs> So I had to show them how to fix the leaky faucet. It just flabbergasted me. But maybe the reason why they don't have the survival skills is because extras were, were too busy uh, navel-gazing, and then we failed to teach that generation how to do these things. Maybe that's our fault. The cultural challenges were, were the challenges to the Christian faith was pain and suffering. If there was a loving God, then why did he allow so much pain and suffering? Uh, if indeed there is, a, is, there is a God, and he allows this kind of suffering, it means God is not good. Or God is not great. Or God is neither good nor great. This is the generation that's producing the new atheists. The new atheists, and you have to watch this really careful, this, this movement. It sees religion as the problem. It polarizes. It produces conflicts. And they show, look at all the conflicts in the church. All right? So that validates it. That's why churches need to get rid of conflict. It's not a good witness to that generation or this generation. They teach Christians as bigoted, homophobic, and we're just better off without them. And imagine if you try to preach a gospel that uh, salvation is simply a ticket to heaven. What would happen? They're not interested in the future. The future's too far away. They want help now with problems, with life challenges. They look at how exes do church, and they say, you know what? Um, there has to be more than just hanging out. It, you can't be just a spiritual breakfast club, you know? You got to do something. You got to make a difference. Being at Revel Revelation 7 9 church, being at a church that you, on earth as it is in heaven, that resonates. Seeing that Jesus breaks down prejudices, that resonates. Um, seeing how Christ makes your life flourish, how Christ answers life's problems, it, it communicates. And seeing a church involved in practical forms of outreach that makes a difference in the community, that resonates. That excites them. They're not about being hev the heavenly future. They're all about being earthly good. And then the last one, and we'll go into communion, the iGen generation, the internet generation. How many of you are out there? It's 2002 to present. All right, all right. We, there's a little more. Millennials, we got to do something with millennials. There's more of those out there. Now, what are their characteristics? Well, 
we don't know yet. The, the, that generation hasn't yet formed or taken shape. But here's what we know about their spiritual question. The spiritual question is, what is beautiful? What is just? It has to look, look good. It has to catch your attention. The architecture, art, beauty. Beauty's huge. Glory. Glory is inner fulfillment. Seeing the beauty of, of things. Uh, they will not look at your church website if it doesn't pop. It has all this wonderful information. They're not going to read the information if it's lame. It has to look really good. <laughs> uh, so to share the gospel with this generation, you've you got, you got to show how glorious the gospel is and how the gospel brings beauty in people's lives. So I shared all this information. Simply, it's the longest illustration you ever hear. All right. Simply to challenge you to leave here today and, for, and this week, go talk with someone outside of your generation and get to know them and use some of this information as a way of here's I can, how I can speak to them, how I can relate to them, how I can love them the way that they can hear it. Use this information. I'll post it uh, and I'll send it to everyone through an email and post it on the website as well. Now the last thing, how do you love then as Jesus taught? He says, as I have loved you. You can't love this way horizontally until you first experience it vertically. And have you experienced the love of God as expressed in the cross of Christ? A lot of us have. We just need a new experience of it. Sometimes I get a new experience of it through a sermon. Sometimes it's through a worship set. And not, or you, you brought in the presence of God. Or you, you see a great film. I, I usually watch the, one of the Jesus films. One of the films about Christ's life during the Lenten period. Just to reconnect, re-experience the cross. Something about that just hitting you and that love just kind of flows in you and then flows out of you. However you experience the cross, I encourage you to do so. Maybe it's reading the gospel. Maybe it's seeing a film. Oh, I, I find it, some of the most powerful things just seeing a secular film. So as we enter into communion to kind of prepare ourselves, I want you to re-experience the power of the cross through this clip.